We as Christians are in a spiritual battle. And as soldiers of Christ, we run our course with a resolute in our hearts, in our minds, to win the race of our Christian life. <clears throat> the Christian life is a journey and not a hundred yard dash. When you, when you run short distance races, you need you need, uh, you need to be hyper and uh, you need to be quick. But when you run a marathon, you need a stamina that will last a long time. You need endurance. Endurance, endurance is what leads the runner to the finish. And it's a hard work. It's a long time. It's a lifetime. In our case. I didn't title this as a race. I titled it as a journey. I titled this message as a journey because this is a race that lasts our lifetime. So it's a journey. <clears throat> and there's joy in the journey. When we think about life, Christian life and the challenges we have in Christian life, we can be bogged down with discouragement and concern and say, will I make it? Yes, you can. You will, if you want to. And we have in chapter 11, the previous chapter to the one that was read, a few verses from chapter 12 was read to us, the whole chapter is a list of those who did their marathon in a fantastic way. And they finished their race. So we have the lead from them, we have the encouragement from them, and then we can look at their lives by looking into the stories of their lives and be challenged and be encouraged so we too can run and finish the race. Joy is relational. Happiness is circumstantial. Happiness depends on the duration of the so-called happy event. You heard of happy hours? <laughs> it finishes when that goes down, right? And there are many events and many circumstances that are that has a beginning and that has a finish. And it can be quite short. But joy is not something that ends. Joy is something that is always there. Joy is a calm delight about a truth that never changes. Because joy is rubbed on us, shared with us, by a person. That's why I call joy is relational. It happens in the context of a relationship with the source of joy, who is a person, that is Jesus. A Sunday school teacher was attempting to impress upon a class of teenagers the importance of living the Christian life. He just, he just wanted to make sure that they really got the message. And so he said, uh, why do people call me a Christian? Why do people call me a Christian? <laughs> the man asked and then there was a pause and silence for some time. Then one youngster said, maybe it's because they don't know you. Well, it's good to laugh about that, right? But that could be true in our case too. <clears throat> People present, I make a very good presentation of a Christian.
But then the Lord knows what's presented on the outside and he knows what's actually inside. The letter to the Hebrews was addressed to the Jewish Christians and was written at a time of their intensified persecution, which of course culminated in, in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. God ordained and intended this letter to be prepared for such a time as that for them and prepare them for the worse. God has a message for us from this book from all of it and for now he has a message for us from these few words that I'm going to share with you let's pause for prayer Heavenly Father Lord we thank you for Jesus we thank you the joy is in your presence your assurance of your everlasting love your promise of your everlasting salvation to us all wrapped up in the person of Christ is ours and it's only because of your grace and by the gift of your faith to us so we were able to believe and enter into this wonderful joyous relationship with Jesus Lord Help us as we listen to you. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Amen. Reading through those three verses in chapter 12, we saw that um, our life with Jesus is present as a race. It's a race to run. God spoke long ago in various ways and has progressed his speech to the finality of his message in his son, the Lord Jesus. When God progressed, he moved from the Old Testament to the New. He moved from the prophets and angels to his own son that is incarnate God God in the flesh he moved from the animal sacrifices to the death of Christ on the cross and he moved from the covering of the sins to the forgiveness and the removal of sins that's a big change isn't it has God moved yes he has moved <laughs> And then we see that he has moved from the shadows to the realities and to the fulfillments. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews is about. So this was a preparatory word from the Lord for people who are going to be going through intense persecution, lose their religious values which they were holding on to. And God prepared them to say, you know what I have it <laughs> not in those symbols not in those sacrifices not in those passing religious things but it's in a person it's in my son here is a fulfillment and that's the message of the book of Hebrews by God's grace many of us who are here we have moved from being sinners to saints <laughs> and that's a good move isn't it Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and so, that's why what we're going to look into in terms of God's word to us tonight, today, will be something that will be relevant to our situation. Because we move from being sinners to saints. And then as such, our life is a journey of faith in Christ. And it is starkly different from the way of this world. We are Christians in this world. 
And this world doesn't operate the way the Lord wants us to function. It's very different. So it's always challenging and we are always the odd ones. And uh, sadly, most of the time, we choose not to be the odd ones. Because we assimilate with the culture and with the way of life that are around us. Because to be called the odd one is kind of a racist. <laughs> so we don't like that. So we don't want to be odd ones. But that's exactly what the Lord wants us to be. We are special people. We are peculiar people because we've been called out by Him to belong to Him. So, in this following Jesus, in this Christian life that's so starkly different from the regular life that we see out in the world, we need absolute faith. When I say absolute faith, I'm talking about an ingredient that most of us don't think is needed, or some of us don't even know that ingredient, the faith. Faith is an attitude of dependence on God in a very simple term. But there is something that's a very much part of that faith that some of us miss it. And what's that? Strong faith, brother. A faith that will hold on. <laughs> no, it's more than that. It's not just dedication, it's not just determination. It's endurance. What is endurance? And so that's talked about here in these verses. You see, if, you, if I'm just reading through some of this here, in verse uh, 1, in verse 1, in chapter 12, he says, um, since you have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding you, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance that is set before you. And then he goes on to say, <laughs> verse 2, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, okay, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So then in verse 3, again he says, for consider this Christ who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. So, endurance is a very important ingredient in our faith. I'll go into that a little bit more later on, but then these virtues, faith, dedication, determination, our commitment to Christ and our endurance, these virtues are God's gifts to us and it's part of the parcel. We are partakers of the divine nature. That's what happened when we were born again. When we were born again, God made a deposit of his life in our spirits. We were born again by the Holy Spirit. That the life of God came into our spirits. And then onwards to activate our soul, our mind, our emotions and our will so that we behave by this life of God activating our person. So we live out, we live out that life through us. But these virtues need to be energized by His Spirit. We need His Holy Spirit to be energizing, empowering us in this walk so we can be enduring Christians. The cloud of witnesses is in reference to all the heroes whose names are mentioned in chapter 11. You know, when we read about um, big names, kings of the Old Testament, 
And Samson, wow, I'd like to be like Samson. I would like to be like David, you know. Talk about, I'd like to be like Joshua. I'd like to, I'd like to be like Gideon. All these people who are empowered into actions, missions, which were God-ordained, and they triumphantly experienced victory that stood out as victory. And then when you go to verse 36 onwards, chapter 11, just turn to it, you're right there. Chapter 11, verse 36 onwards, we, we read about <laughs> a list of names and uh, a list of people whose names are not there. And others, a category whose names are not mentioned, others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. I'm going on reading this for you. It says in verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with a sword, they went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains, caves and holes in the ground. <laughs> holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. And yet they endured. Because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. We were the privileged, the blessed ones by God's grace that we have Jesus, the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament people waited for. And we have it fulfilled and we have it applied. And these people, they only saw that at a distance and ran towards the mark that was set before them. Now, God is trustworthy. He's faithful. That's what these, these heroes in chapter 11 are testifying. They're the ones who are witnessing this strong, profound truth. God is trustworthy. He's faithful. He will not let you go. He will not let you down. And that is a promise of God and they have experienced that. Even though they did not receive what was promised to them. That is faith in God who is unmovable, unshakable. So these are the cloud of witnesses that we have surrounding us and they have finished their journey. And we take encouragement from them so we can move on in our Christian life. Now, he says quite a few things here in this verse, but I'm going to take out three different principles from these three verses. I want to, I want to place that before you. And the first one would be our preparation for the journey. Our preparation. If you want to write it down, go ahead and write it down. I didn't print, I didn't print that for you, but you can please use your pen or pencil and mark those points if you like to. Three principles. One is our preparation. When you see in verse 1, we see right in the first verse, uh, third line we see, therefore since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every weight or encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Our preparation, let us lay aside the weight of sin. Let down the weight of sin. That's the first principle. Our preparation for the Christian life, our preparation for the Christian race, and we've been on it for some time, just in case we have missed this principle, we can take it now. We can apply it right now. Our preparation is to let down the weight of sin. The weight in this context 
is anything that is not of faith. You know, in Romans, Paul writes about whatever is not of faith is sin. We may have many excuses for us to step aside from our main calling. And some of them sound very rational, very reasonable. For instance, Jesus called some people to follow him and one of them said, Lord, I want to follow you. Can I just go and bury my dad and come? He says, let the dead bury the dead, you just follow me. And then he said something very profound. He said, anyone who comes after me, and after he began walking towards me, if he turns back, he is not good for the kingdom. He is unfit for the kingdom. In other words, he was saying, what disqualifies you? Now, you wouldn't call that sin, right? That's everyday priority. Somebody is sick, you need to attend to somebody in the house. Somebody is dead, you need to bury, yes. These are, these are things that are part of our life. But in the light of the supremacy and the higher value of who Jesus is, even the most dearly held things of our lives, mom and dad, wife and children, and my own life, becomes and must take a second place. This is hard. It's been very hard for me. The Lord called me to be here when I was needed to be with my daughter who was going through a very rough, rough, rough time of life. And I'm sure the brothers would have understood if I'd explained the reasons and let me go. It wasn't just for a visit, but I had to make a commitment to be where the Lord wanted me to be. I'm still struggling with it. Don't think it's, it's over. I'm still struggling with it. We need to take him, his call, and all that he tells to be number one. And those things are weights that can drag us down and slow us down. And don't leave out the bigger weight. It's a sin. It could be many. We have sin problems. Sometimes we put these excuses as excuses to hide our sin of being lethargic or being lazy spiritually so we can stay behind or stay away from the actual call of duty. If I'm speaking very openly, that's what the Lord is telling me to tell you. You know, sin slows us down. Is there anyone here today with the weight of sin that is hindering you to carry on in your journey with Jesus? I'm talking to Christians. Whatever your sin may be, I'm talking to Christians again. Unbelief, fear, hatred, unforgiving spirit, lies, Abusive speech. Oh, we do it at home. Nobody hears it. Pride. Make, that makes you a total loser. Sexual sins. Oh. 
talk to Christians on all kinds of unrighteousness. None of us are left out of it. We have the sin nature still in our beings. I'm talking about myself too. We are saved. We have the life of God in us. But we have sin nature in this system. And one day we'll be stripped away from that sin nature and we'll be totally freed and that's the final phase of salvation. Amen? That's going to happen. But right now, we are in this struggle. Let's not try to sweep it under the carpet and say, No, oh, I'm fine. Hallelujah, brother. I'm fine. <laughs> That's going to slow you down. Take the carpet, sweep it out, and then deal with it. First principle, let down the weight of sin. Now, the instruction here is what? Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance. Okay, well before we come to that, we see that lay aside this sin. How do, we, how do you lay aside sin? Well, that's, that's the expression used here. But then the scriptures teach us how we can actually lay our sins away. Now, if I don't tell you that, then, then my communication is incomplete, so I have to tell you that. How can you lay, lay it down and lay it away? How do you lay aside and, and then that's done and we don't have that burden anymore? It keeps cropping up again, but what has been exposed has to be done away with. It's a process. As you walk in the light, he keeps cleansing us. It's a process. But how do we lay it away? The scriptures tell us we can lay our sins away by doing this. What? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. And how does he cleanse us? By what kind of water? No, no, no. By his own blood. Verse 7, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, he says, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. That's the real laying it away business. But then we have to confess our sins. We have to confess our sins. Now, <laughs> Jesus came into this world to take away our sins, and not only our sins, but also the sin of the whole world. First John, I mean John chapter 1 verse 29, John proclaims, Here, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Brothers and sisters, I'm not finished with the Christians yet, but I want to relate to some people who are here, who are here maybe not relating to what I'm talking about. You're talking to the Christians, what about me? I, I think I am a Christian, but maybe not, because the things that you're talking about doesn't really make any reference to my situation. Maybe you're not a Christian. That's not a bad news. It's a news that needs some attention, and I'll address to that as well. But I'm still not done with the Christians here. Brothers and sisters, if your sins are gone, how amazingly lighter and swifter you will be to run! You know what David says? How blessed is he whose sin is forgiven. He must have felt so released and light-hearted. Some of us just keep on putting on weight, isn't it? And then we do diet. We keep on putting on weight. 
See, the Lord has a wonderful way of losing weight. <laughs> Confess it to him, he takes it away. That's the weight that he's concerned about. That's the weight we should be concerned about, nothing else. All of the things are just immaterial in some ways. You know, we, we need to know first things first. The same David who said, how blessed is a man whose sins are forgiven, he also says, but when I did not confess, when I was shrinking from confessing and trying to hide and hold back, I became sick. He says, my body just was withering. I was wasting away. And then I said, oh, I will confess. And then when I confessed, he forgave me. So, what's the warning here? If there's anyone here, I'm talking to Christians. If there's anyone here, right now, today, who has problem of sin. Don't, don't just do keep quiet and hold them because you can't handle them. You can't. Sin has to be dealt by the Savior. He alone can deal with, deal with it. Only he can take it away and he'll forgive you. So take time to go to Jesus and say, Lord, come to Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me. And he'll cleanse you. He'll forgive you. But if there's anyone here today who has not known this Jesus, the forgiver, the savior, anyone here? Anyone here? There is hope for you. You can begin that journey right now. Today is your opportunity. And Jesus saves you. He'll give you that gift of faith to believe in him and he will save you. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll make you brand new. He'll make you his possession. He'll make you a child of God, son of God, daughter of God, and you'll become his own. And then you'll be on the way with us. And he takes care of you. We are here to help you, and so please stay back and we can talk with you. If there's anyone here, we are here to help you. Let's go to the next principle. First is our preparation, laying down the weight of sin. And the second principle is what? Our expedition. Because it's a journey, I call it expedition. I can call it a commission, or I can call it a mission, but then I would call it expedition because it is a journey. Our life is a journey. Second principle is lay, laying hold of the life of life in Christ. Laying hold of the life in Christ, and that's what we are taking in verse um, uh, verse verse two, no verse one. End of verse one. We see that uh, run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, that's the third principle. We'll come to the second one first now. And you see that uh, the race that is set before us is the Christian life that we have been called into. That's our expedition. Let us run with endurance. Our expedition, our journey, is to lay hold of the life in Christ. Run is the, um, is the word that is used here. And uh, we need to see that um, when we read the word race or run, we think it is a competition. Um, Christian life is not just like a competition. It's more than that. Because the word race, which is here in your translation, in my translation, is a translation of a Greek word, um, Agon, and uh, it's an interesting word. I tell you why. Because which is this word agon is from another word agonia, and the English word agony, 
Now you know what I'm looking up here. The English word agony comes from the word agonia. So what does agon or agonia means? It's a struggle. It's pain. It's, 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 it's hardship. It's a conflict. That is what is said before us. We are alive in Christ, we are born again, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we have amazing promises, but we have this strife, the struggle. And it's just for a short time. It's in this world only, not beyond this world. And Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulations. Faith cannot withstand, faith that cannot withstand testing cannot be trusted. I will say that again. Faith that cannot, be, that cannot withstand testing cannot be trusted. And one preacher very well put it. He said, if your faith fizzles before the finish, it was faulty from the first. We need to have an enduring faith. The heroes of faith mentioned in chapter 11 looked beyond pain, suffering and death. And what was the context of their faith? If you read through chapter 11, I don't have to explain that to you. You will see it very clearly. The context of their faith is what? Danger, pain, suffering, shame, insults, imprisonment, rejection, wilderness, a long waiting, and then what? Death. That was the context. That was their context. Endurance is a faith that is durable. Faith, will, faith that will last a long time. A faith that will not snap, break. A faith that has a good elasticity. A faith that will go beyond death. And that's where it becomes hope fulfilled. It is a faith that contains hope of resurrection. If we avoid suffering, we cannot grow to maturity. You know, we want to we wanna help each other sometimes, and we think it's a great help we give to each other. We try to create shortcuts. We help each other to not go through the process which God has ordained for each other. Because we think, at least that will make it easy for you to be a good Christian. <laughs> but then, it is the Lord's ordination that for us not just to believe, but also to suffer for Christ's sake. That's what Paul said. And then John, James said, consider it all joy when you are going through pain and suffering because this is going to make your faith become strong and this making is called endurance and when you have finished enduring you will become perfect lacking in nothing if that is God's process to take us to suffering and pain and if we try to avoid it are we helping someone or hurting someone you answer yourselves I'm going to give you a story here there was a man who was watching the emperor moth come out of its cocoon. Probably some of you know this story already. He felt sad for the moth, for it was a long and struggling process for the moth to come out of its cocoon and spread its beautiful wings and fly to its freedom. So what did he do? 
he decided to take home a cocoon so he could watch the emperor moth emerge because he already thought of something in his mind he was going to do. As he watched the cocoon at home, when the time came, the moth struggled to get out through the tiny opening in the cocoon. So the man decided to help the process by enlarging it with the snip of his scissors. Wow! What a great help, eh? The moth emerged easily. That's all he wanted to see. Just get out so you're free. But then what? It came out. The moth did not spread its wings. The wings were shriveled and it couldn't spread its wings. It was just right there. The merciful snip in reality was cruel because it was God's way to force fluid from its body into its wings so the wings will develop. Our shortcuts are not God's ways. <laughs> Sometimes our help is not help, it's hurt. We must be willing to go through pain and suffering and that's a process God has laid before us. That's how we mature in our faith. Lastly, the last principle is important principle that is in both verses 2 and 3. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. The Lord knows that it's painful for us to go through these experiences in life even after believing in him. I know the Lord Jesus. I know my Savior. I'm born again. I'm going to heaven. But I have all these problems. I have these challenges. I have to suffer. I have this hardship. It's part of the package. For the first part of the journey. Because remember, our journey is not finishing when we die or when Jesus returns to take us home. Because our journey is with him forever and ever and ever. So when I say dread is joy in the journey, I'm talking about for the greater part, for the longer part, there is joy and celebration forever and ever and ever. In comparison with that never-ending joyous celebration with him, our time of suffering and pain is so short. It's a little while. Can't we, honestly, can't we just go through that little while? And if we think we can't, consider Jesus. For our salvation, for our freedom, for our eternity bliss with him, for our joy, he endured the cross. Who is he? The son of God. The one who was on the throne of God. From there he descended and condescended to become a human. In his sinlessness, he became sin for you and for me. He was spat upon in his face. He was bashed by people. He was called all kinds of names. He was dragged on the street. He was nailed on the cross. Then he, there he was challenged. Well, while he was suffering half naked, he was challenged. Come down if you are so, so and so. Otherwise we know what you are. And then he endured all that for me and for you. He had one thing, he had one thing, the joy. 
that was set before him. And what is that? What is that joy? Look at this verse. The one who despised the shame, the cross, the pain, and the insults, he rose from the dead, and then he, and we see in end of verse 2, he, he, was, he rose from the dead, and he was exalted in his ascension, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Not below the throne of God. <laughs> right at, at the right side of the throne of God. That is meaning that he sat on the throne of God. He is God. Now, how is that going to be an encouragement to us? How is that going to be an encouragement to us? I want you to see one verse in... Um, um, Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. Just, just see the verse because I'm not going to be explaining that because you know what it means. Um, so just look at that verse. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. This is the Lord's message to the seven churches. And this, this particular message, verses 14 down to the end of verse 22 of chapter 3, is the last message to the seventh church. And that is a church in Laodicea. That's the church that was lukewarm. That is the church that talks about today's church in the world. In a way, that is our situation. And so, the Lord spells out something amazing which he did not talk about to any other church. And what is that? He says in verse 21, I'll read from verse 20. I stand at the door, behold, I stand at the door, knock. If anyone hears my voice and open, my, open the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him. That means I'll have fellowship with him and he with me. And then verse 21, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I have also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. That's very deep. And I'm not going to break it down for you. <laughs> that was his joy. Well, when he got back to the throne, he was just being reinstated in, in a way. He was reinstated because that's where he's from, right? He's from there, he went back there. But what is his joy? When I go back there, and if you follow me, I'm going to take you there and make you sit with me. And that is my joy. And that is your joy. And that's not small joy. Joy is relational. It depends on how you're doing with Jesus today. And then we'll be crowned. I'm finishing. I just want to tell you something else. We are concerned about crowns, right? Because some of us think, I don't think we'll get it. Only if some people like Brother Brian and Brother Charles will get it. George, bad news man, I don't think you'll get it. <laughs> just imagine if some of us have crowns and some of us don't have it. Has anybody talked about it? Have you thought about that? Some of us have crowns, some of us don't have it. And those who have crowns, great show. And those, those who don't have it, that's how we picture in our minds, right? What do we read in the Word? They cast their crowns at the feet of the Lamb. Now you might wonder, come on brother George, I think this is the wrong doctrine you're teaching. Why should I lay away my crown? I've earned it. No, sorry. The faith that you have is from him. Faithfulness is enabled by him. Reward to your faithfulness is from him. So if it is from him, and through him and to him, the crown must go back to him. 
And that realization we will completely comprehend and enjoy and rejoice in doing it. It wasn't grudgingly, oh boy, I have to lay my crown before. No, they were gladly throwing away the crowns back at his feet because it's from you, it's by you, and it's to you. There is joy in the journey. And that time with him in celebration of his presence because in his right hand there is fullness of joy that never ends. There's joy in the journey. Don't be discouraged by the short while challenges. <laughs>